welcome everybody to our Friday afternoon capstone presentation on um, food insecurity. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to our team of fellows that's presenting and let y'all take it away. Perfect, thank you, Sydney. Um, hello everyone, first off, thank you so much for attending this panel today. Um, my group, which consists of Myself, Brandon Rolison, Marina McManns, and Kuku Saw are so grateful to have these great panelists here today to discuss the important topic of food insecurity. And before starting the panel, we just wanted to share a tiny bit of background information. Um, so let me just share my screen. Um, first, what is food insecurity? Um, before starting the or as defined by Feeding America, um, food insecurity is a lack of consistent access to enough food for a active, healthy life. In Iowa, one in 11 people face food insecurity, but more severely, one in eight children um, face food insecurity. Iowa is also ranked last in the United States for fruit and vegetable consumption. So how can you help? Obviously, we will be discussing more of this in the panel, but we just wanted to highlight some local organizations helping to fight food insecurity. Uh, we will copy this list into the Zoom chat so you can save it from there, and we urge you to take a closer look after this panel. Um, some of these organizations have great volunteer opportunities, while others you can support simply by donating or attending various events. And we hope you take advantage of this list and the, inter and the information shared in the panel motivates you to help out. Um, so now I will hand it over to Brandon who will be introducing the panelists. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. Uh, and hello everyone. Uh, we have two excellent panelists joining us today. Uh, our first panelist is Brigetta Beardsley. She is currently the Vice President of Philanthropy for the Food Bank of Iowa. Uh, where she leads the fundraising, volunteering, and marketing teams and has been there since 2018. Uh, she also held roles at other non local nonprofits such as the Community Foundation of Greater Des Moines, Mercy One Foundation, and United Way of Central Iowa. Uh, Brigetta lives in Ankeny with her husband and she has three children. Uh, next, we have Joelle Noller from Farm Bureau Financial Services joining us. Uh, she's been a member of their human resources team for the last, the last 15 years. In 2014, she worked with United Way to lead the Corporate Giving Garden Initiative at Farm Bureau, and they have donated over 20,000 pounds of fresh produce to the Food Bank of Iowa since the program's inception. Uh, she has also served on Farm Bureau's United Way Committee, organized the CFI Adopt a Family Program, volunteered to read in the classroom at Crossroad Elementary, and serves on the WINS Committee as well. Joelle is married and has two children, and will be adding a daughter-in-law to the family in July, so how exciting. So again, a big thank you to our panelists for joining us this afternoon. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Cuckoo and Marina as they'll be serving as the moderators for our panel today. Perfect. Thank you so much, Brandon. Uh, panelists, thanks for joining us for another uh, fellowship session. Uh, thank you so much for making the, the time to talk to us about food insecurity. Uh, so we, uh, starting with the initial questions and um, Marina will be taking a couple of questions to us uh, towards the end. Um, first of all, we'd love to hear a little bit about your organization's approach to, to food insecurity. Um, with uh, Joelle just talking about your corporate garden um, and, and a little bit of understanding why, why that was, you consider that important. Yes, absolutely. So in 2014, I was reached out to by United Way. Um, Shirley Burgess was the volunteer coordinator at United Way at that time. And I had known Shirley from years from serving on the United Way committee and um, had a good relationship with her. And United Way was looking at starting this corporate giving garden initiative within Des Moines. So they identified us as one of those initial companies to see if we would be interested in that. Again, because we already had such a strong relationship with United Way and we're very active in volunteer activities. Um, so with the corporate giving garden, it took a little bit of finagling to get that approved. We had to have several meetings with our facilities department before they would agree to, you know, plow up a 1600 square foot plot of soil on our beautiful grounds here. If you've ever been out to Farm Bureau, you um, know that they take a lot of pride 
in the lawn and what it looks like. So they were a little concerned about um, plowing it up and, and having a garden and the weeds and it not being taken care of. So before they would do that, we had to make sure that we had enough employee interest to volunteer in the, in the program. So I sent out an initial survey to our employees here and was just overwhelmed by the response that we received. Um, I had well over 60 individuals raise their hand and say, yes, I would really be interested in helping out in the garden. And not only that, we had um, five or six people that were very experienced and skilled in gardening and, and uh, raised their hand to serve on the committee as well. So that was very helpful. So after we had the buy-in from our employees and the buy-in from facilities, we had to get the buy-in from management teams. So that just involved putting together a proposal on what that would look at. And they said they would allow it. So 2014, with a lot of help from facilities, we plowed up the, the plot. I formed a committee of wonderful leaders and organized um, the volunteers for that first year. It went really well and it's gone well every year since. So I was always you know, a little nervous the second year, the third year, the fourth year that we would still get the same number of volunteers, but we've been pleasantly surprised every year. So it's, it's been a very successful program. Um, we also try to encourage employees to bring in produce from their own gardens and donate it. So that's been nice. And we do have one family that actually has an orchard and every year they, they take uh, their day of um, their personal volunteer time to go out and pick all of their apples and pears and, and donate that to the Farm Bureau as well. Um, so I think that's a really important program um, and I can I can talk more about it but I'll just turn it over now back to you. Thank you. We'll be, we'll be asking a lot more about it. Um, yeah. Brigetta, can you tell us a little bit about your, your work over at uh, the Food Bank? I'd love to and I'll probably talk too long so just tell me when to stop but so food bank of iowa i'm not sure if any of you have been here but food bank of iowa we're celebrating 40 years this year but as a food bank the diff we talk a lot about the difference between the food bank and a food pantry many folks have been to a food pantry either to volunteer or to seek help but a food bank is kind of on a totally different level so as a food bank we're seen as a wholesaler we bring in mass amounts of food either donated or purchased and then our role is to distribute that food through our partners. And what I mean by partners are um, pantries or the school districts where we have our backpack programs and school pantries. It could be senior centers or daycare centers or homeless shelters that acquire food through us to serve meals for their, for their residents and or um, clients. So as a food bank, we're seen as that wholesaler bringing mass amounts of food, then distributing it in our 55 counties to all of those partners. Now, one thing I learned early on, I've been here almost four years, that the saying, if you've seen one, you've seen them all, does not apply to food banks. And as a food bank, um, as Food Bank of Iowa, a lot of folks think that we serve the whole state. We don't. And I should have had maybe more of a presentation ready, but you can see the green counties are the counties that we serve through the state of Iowa. We serve 55 counties, but there are other food banks within the state of Iowa that cover those 44. And every food bank is different um, because of geography, because of population and so on. And um, so there are almost 200, I think it's 199 food banks across the United States and of the more than 3000 counties in the United States each county is served or touched by a food bank. So collaboration partnership is very important to us, not only within our counties and the partners we work with, but also the other food banks that we work with. So, you know, at a high level that is, that's kind of, um, you know, an overview of what we do as a food bank. Um, I'm sure as questions go on, hopefully I can answer to how we source our food. We source our food through donations, both wholesale and retail donations. We also receive through food from the government through the USDA program, which is a commodity program. And then we also have to purchase food, which we do because of the, the, the grant funding and individual contributions we receive. So our, our mission is to serve food insecure Iowans. That includes families, that includes children, veterans, seniors, and we're really working hard to meet people where they're at and meet the needs that they have. So, does that um, sound? 
It sounds good. You've, you've let us know a little bit of, about the organization. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do there? Sure. What I do is I work alongside and lead the, the philanthropy team. So within that team includes fundraising, our volunteers, and then our marketing team. Uh, so it's, it's really very rewarding. Um, you know, uh, 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 so within, you know, fundraising, that's individual donors, corporate donors, grant funders, um, you know, with volunteers, that's corporate volunteers, individual volunteers, volunteers here at our distribution center, volunteers at our location in Ottumwa, and then volunteers in all the pantries we work with, the mobile distributions we have, volunteers really play a key role with what we do. In fact, last year, calendar year, we, um, and we compile and keep track of volunteer hours, had more than 30,000 volunteer hours. We are a small team, relatively speaking, between the two uh, food bank distribution locations here in Des Moines and Ottumwa. We have about 40 team members. And that includes our you know, truck drivers, our warehouse employees, our my team, um, accounting, just everything. So volunteers are really where you know, the rubber meets the road. If we didn't have our volunteers um, sorting food, checking for food safety, um, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't do what we do. So, and then marketing is just really trying to spread awareness of, of what we do and how people can help and also how people can find help. So does that provide a little bit of an overview? I, I feel it like does. I have the best, best, you know, job in the world and not because, you know, it's hard to see people in need, but it's very, very rewarding to see how people come together to help. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, it is, it is incredibly meaningful that you've dedicated your, your life to, to helping other people. It is appreciated. Um, Joelle, could you tell us a little bit about your role as VP of Philanthropy and how it relates to um, the corporate garden that, that you have and how it relates to food insecurity? Um, that's not my role. My actually, my official role here is I'm a benefit specialist. So um, I have had an opportunity to get involved in many of the extracurricular activities here. So I'll talk a little bit about Farm Bureau Financial Services and what they do to um, help with food insecurity in the community. So one of our pillars of success is social responsibility. And this year, the company is actually focusing on food insecurity. So that really ties in nicely um, with, this, with this panel. So we've set a number of goals this year aimed at addressing that concern. So the first of these is increasing the number of people that donate their you earned it points to Feeding America. So you earned it is our company recognition program. And with that program, employees receive and also give away um, points to employees to just recognize them, thank them, shout out to them. When employees receive these you earned it points, they can use those to cash them in for rewards, um, like gift cards, things from the company store. But also we set up a lot of things where you can give back to the community. So one of the rewards that you can purchase is to donate your points, which are equivalent to dollars, to the food bank, or feed, I'm sorry, Feeding America. Um, so year to date, we have had 14 employees contribute the equivalent of $850 to Feeding America, and we're only like halfway through March, so that's good. Hopefully we'll reach our goal this year for that. Um, Another thing that we did is earlier this month, we hosted an on-site Meals for the Heartland event at our home office. And within that one day, we had enough volunteers to package 40,000 meals in one day. So that really makes a difference, 40,000 meals. Each meal field feeds about six people. So that really made a difference. And it's exciting when we host something like that, that all of our volunteer slots, they just, they fill up so quick. So our employees are passionate about these activities and continue to raise their hand for them. Let's see, another thing that we do is um, every year during our United Way campaign, we um, sponsor a number of volunteer activities. One of the things that we have done for, gosh, at least the last 10 years, maybe more, I don't know when we started doing this, but our employees volunteer to make the um, casseroles for the Salvation Army. So this year, one of our goals is to increase the number of casseroles that we donate to 120. 
And then finally, um, that initiative that is closest to my heart is the, is the corporate giving garden. So we will continue to have our corporate giving garden and, and encourage our employees to volunteer um, towards that. And then one of our goals this year actually for the giving garden is to increase our number of volunteers as well as to increase the number of employees that bring in their own produce from their garden to contribute um, to the Food Bank of Iowa. So um, I don't know about you, I have a garden at home, even though it's just a small um, box garden, there's always extra produce. There's you know, more than enough for my husband and I. So um, a couple of times last summer when I had extra, I would pick it and then I would donate it to the, to the food bank along with the produce that I was delivering for the corporate giving garden. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I have a little garden with a couple of tomatoes and there's this one week period where <laughs> It's an insane amount of tomatoes. It's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> for yeah. one week, I can survive on tomatoes for seven days. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you for I that. I hear you. Uh, Joelle, I'm mean, sorry, uh, Brigitte, a, a quick question. So could you help us understand a little bit on the, the issue of food insecurity in, in Iowa and what your organization is, is doing to, to help address it? I sure, sure will. I could talk a lot about that. I, and, you know, this brings me to thinking about, um, you know, the, the COVID timeframe and, um, you know, food insecurity was definitely prevalent before COVID hit and a silver lining of COVID has been the awareness that has been brought to food insecurity. Um, what we do is really just try to um, talk a lot in any setting about the fact, or in fact, I have a whole presentation around hunger myths that I, you know, give to rotaries or chambers that really, you know, the face of hunger can be in the face of any one of us, of any one of us, anyone you might encounter on the sidewalk or the street or at come and go or your church, you might think they're okay, but um, food insecurity can come and go. We talk about that a lot that one month you might be okay, one month your child gets sick or you need a new refrigerator or you need new tires. And oftentimes people are just one step away from not having enough you know, savings or reserves to um, put food on the table for either themselves or their family. So that is how, as a food bank, we can help um, through the partners, again, that we work with to alleviate and, and bring help to some of those um, people in need that one month might need it, one month you might be okay. So again, it's a lot about partnership and collaboration and um, donations and you know, the whole giving garden um, story is a piece of that. Um, you know, connecting our pantry partners with um, the produce donations that we receive is, is invaluable to, to to many people that we serve. So uh, <clears throat> I don't know if that answers the question or if I got off tangent, but um, there's just so much I could talk about. You, you did you did answer the question. Thank you so much. And, and um, Joel, you touched on this, this question um, a little bit too. Um, just the reason it's important to, to your organization, um, if you wanted to expand, you, you could. Um, I think that, like I said, one of our pillars of success, we have um, six pillars of success that our company lives by. One of those this year is it's social responsibility. So what do we do to give back to the community and how can we help the community? We've always been um, very strong in giving back to the community. We've been recognized several times by United Way. We do things with the Variety Club, Habitat for Humanity. We've sponsored homes. We volunteer with Special Olympics. There are so many things that we do, but by identifying social responsibility is one of our pillars of success. We have set into place more concrete goals. Um, so I think that, um, I think I used to work in recruiting and in recruiting, I think it's really important to employees, especially millennials. And I think all of you on this call can relate to this. It's very important for you to work for a company that has a strong moral compass and has an opportunity to volunteer um, within the organization, or sorry, with, to volunteer within the community. 
and to do other things besides just your job every day. You really want to feel like you're, you're giving back. So I think that's one of the reasons why social responsibility is such an important pillar of strength. When we're recruiting, when we're going to college campuses, when we are out there trying to tell employees why we're such a great company to work for, we can say, hey, not only do you get to come to work every day and protect livelihoods, protect livelihoods and, and futures, you also have an opportunity to do all these awesome volunteer activities and give back to the community. So um, I think that's important in recruiting and, and keeping our employees and keeping them engaged. Thank you. And, and I think just looking at the group of fellows here, uh, it's understandable that, that that's incredibly important, like as far as who we work for is concerned, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure that we're working for people who are responsible as far as not just the environment is concerned, but the community. So um, it is appreciated. Um, so we've, we've talked about food and security. We've talked about why your organizations feel like it's, it's important. Um, with the path that you've taken, um, Joelle, first question to you, what are some challenges that you experienced, um, especially with, with uh, developing a, a corporate giving garden. Right, yeah. I think the number one challenge that um, any committee or, or company faces is communication. We can put all these programs into place, but how do we get that information out to our employees and make sure that they see it? So we try to over communicate a lot of these opportunities by you can't send an email out for everything. So we, we post it on our intranet. Um, some things do come directly from our management team. If we feel it's an important enough initiative, we'll, we'll um, send a message from our office of the CEO. But I think that's a big thing is just communication. So, hey, here's all these opportunities. How do we get them out there? Um, I guess a great example of that is just yesterday, I was playing phone tag with one of our employees. And by the time he called me back, he said, hey, I'm really sorry. I was out of the office today doing a volunteer activity. I'm like, oh, that's great. What did you do? I love it when our employees um, use their volunteer time off that we provide for them. And he told me about, a, um, it was like an ag in the classroom event that he was doing. And I said, hey, do you know how to record your volunteer hours? And he goes, no, I don't. I, I need to know that. So I, I had to let him know how to record it. So again, that's something that, you know, we we want our employees to volunteer and we want to track all of those hours, but making sure that they know how to track those hours is a challenge. So that that is always one of the challenges, tracking volunteer hours. Um, so, yeah, I would say communication is probably the, the biz, biggest obstacle we have to getting our employees to kind of like buy in. And, you know, I mentioned that we encourage employees to donate their own produce to our garden. I don't think a lot of employees realize they can do that. They haven't read it on the hub. They haven't heard about it. They haven't gotten the message. So again, we just need to learn to over communicate all of that information. Thank you. Um, forget it. Same, same question to you. Um, just as far as the food bank of I was concerned, um, what, what are some challenges that you face in addressing the, the issue of food insecurity? Well, what comes to my mind right now is um, just capacity. I don't know, again, how many of you have been out to the food bank, but we had a major renovation. It'll be four years ago this summer that it finished. Um, we are near off of Guthrie Avenue in an industrial section. The building we're in used to be a beer distribution center, which was great for us. We've been in this location um, probably 20 to 25 years, but we had a major renovation to build capacity. Um, we did not add on to our building, but in the distribution center, we added racking, which basically tripled the amount of food we could put back there. We added a new cooler and a new freezer. Um, and with that, we increased our cooler, cooler space, refrigerator space, I believe by five times and our freezer space by three times. So that was just huge for us because, um, and it also allowed for greater efficiencies. You know, I won't get in the weeds too much, but better lighting. And um, we also separated our volunteer center, which was more safe. And a big thing we always focus on is food safety. We're held to standards by Feeding America to always have a food safe environment. But with that, one would not have imagined when we did that um, renovation that we would so quickly be at capacity. And I believe some, you know, some of this is related to COVID, but um, 
we are oftentimes bursting at the seams and unfortunately sometimes have to turn away donations because of space. Now we do have great partners like Des Moines, Des Moines Cold Storage and Ankeny Cold Storage that will allow us to store some product there. But then there's also the inefficiencies of having to go and pick up food from those locations before it can go back on the road. So we're taking a look right now at adding on to the backside of our building. We currently have about 50,000 square feet here for storage and um, that addition would be a 30,000 square foot um, addition just for basically um, cooler freezer and dry storage area. So capacity is always a challenge. We do have uh, a, the additional distribution center in Ottumwa and through some grant funding added uh, a staging cooler and freezer there recently, which has helped. But um, so I would say capacity and, and um, you know, being able to, you know, always see inventory coming in and out at maximum levels is important to us. In addition to that, I guess I would echo, you know, what Joel said as far as communication is always a challenge too, and how can we better communicate to people in need where to go when they're in need. Uh, we have resource sheets for every county we're in. Um, we are up updating our website. Um, it won't be a total transformation, but an update should be occurring in the next couple of weeks. We always drive people to our website. There is a map where they can put in a zip code to find out where the, their pantries are that they can receive help. Um, also communication, again, with the difference between a food bank and a food pantry, and also um, how people can become involved. So, uh, you know, communication is something we're always trying to, to do better. Um, as well, and just to get the word out about how we as a food bank work with our partners and how others can become involved with that work. So. so just uh, there's a quick thing that I wanted a little bit more information on. So just as far as um, some of the partnerships that you have with, with storage, how does that work? So is processing happening at the food bank and then storage happening um, with uh, your partner and then coming back or is food being sent directly to the partner and then being moved over to, to the food bank for, for processing? I think, you know, and I'm not the, I'm not the specialist in that okay. area. We have a whole food acquisition team and, mm -hmm. and um, receiving team. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe the food would still come here and we would receive it and then as needed, direct it to the other locations. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I could get back to you on a better answer there, but a um, lot of logistics, but we've got a great team around inventory. Uh, we take inventory monthly. We always have close to 100% with inventory numbers. So there is a whole routine around that. And also um, the inventory system, which our pantry partners order from, it's been called or reference to me as like a Amazon system or, or maybe not quite as an antiquated um, Amazon system, but our partners can go on to our site daily, our computer system to see exactly what we have in inventory. So if they want to order or pick up an order, they can um, or see, you know see what's available. And um, that partner communication is very key. And that's a whole another topic I can get into when I talk about how every food bank's different. What's been worked very well for our team is what we call a regional, uh, regional model. So within our 55 counties, we divide those 55 counties into five regions. Now Polk County is its own region. And um, we have a regional partnership coordinator that just works with partners. And again, partners mean the schools, pantries, shelters, senior centers, daycare centers in, so we have one person who works with Polk County alone. And then the other four have a group of, I would say 10 to 15 counties that they travel. And they're really boots on the ground to hear firsthand from our partners, what the needs are. Um, how can we, you know, bring people together? How can we maximize what, 
you know, pantry A is doing with pantry B or the school district. And so again, that communication is key. And for us, that regional model has worked really well. We're also working now to set up what we're calling regional roundtables. Um, it's not going to be a governance related committee per se, but a group of interested folks from those five different regions that meet periodically to talk about, you know, is a business closing in this community? Do we think we need to add a mobile distribution? Or is a new business coming to town that might give us potential for sponsorships or funding? Um, so we're, and, but the other, the other thought around those regional roundtables is, you know, what happens up in Winnebago County is totally different than what's going down in Lee, in Lee County in Southern Iowa. You know, we want to have diversity of thought. We want to make sure we're serving all um, as equitably as we can. And so uh, we're, we're hoping this regional roundtable model will help us help us even further with, with those types of goals. So um, anyway. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, one more question for me and then uh, Marina will take over. Um, so most of us on this call work for local companies. How can the companies that we work for help in the fight against food insecurity? And Joel, Would we can like start with we can start with Joel. So that we're gonna you can take a, a quick. Uh, <laughs> I know I, I threw a couple of questions at you, so if you want to take a just a, a quick breather, here yeah. you can. Again, I'm a huge proponent of the Corporate Giving Garden. Um, since the program was initiated in 2014, I believe United Way has set goals every year to continue to increase the number of Corporate Giving Gardens in the Des Moines area. Originally, it started with us, Guide One, John Deere Financial, and since then it's grown every year. Um, they have asked me to go out to organizations and talk to them or talk to their committee or facilities department about how we started ours and how we make it successful and how our committee is set up. So I am always more than happy to do that. So if any of you here are interested in getting a corporate given, giving garden set up at your organization, certainly feel free to email me or call me and I can talk you through all the different steps that we had. And then I already mentioned just some other things that we did um, on site here with the, the breakfast casseroles. Salvation Army is always looking for breakfast casseroles. It's a really, what I love about that volunteer activities, if activity is that employees, we provide the dishes, they pick up the dishes, they take them home, they make the casseroles at home. And what a great thing to do with your family, with for your young kids to make those casseroles with them and explain to them, this is what these are used for. So, um, I love the breakfast casserole program and, and being able to do that. Meals for the Heartland, doing the build on site here. One of the challenges I think that companies face is what can we do for volunteer activities? What are some on-site volunteer activities that we can do? Um, so again, the Corporate Giving Garden is a great one, um, as well as that Meals for the Heartland um, program where we brought, they, we had them bring all the food in here and, and set it up downstairs in our um, our, uh, our gym area. Um, so yeah, those are some things I think that other companies can do. Thank I'm sure Brigetta can think of a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to jump in. That's a great springboard though. Thanks, Joelle. And yes, we, I know we love the partnership we have with you all in the Corporate Giving Gardens. And you're right, it has grown. Um, um, Emily Shears, our um, contact for that program, and she said, I think you mentioned some companies too, but additional ones um, nationwide, Pioneer, also Bridgestone, Firestone, which is close to us, and these gardens don't have to be big. I mean, some are definitely, but um, we will, at our back door, we have a place where you can pull a truck up or a van or your car, ring the doorbell and somebody's there to help with donations. If you need a receipt, we will weigh the donations. Um, so we have, you know, in those kind of garden producing months, we have donations coming daily. We also, with that regional partnership model, we will match up pantries. So sometimes the food doesn't even come here. It goes directly to the pantry nearest the corporate giving garden, which is great too. So, um, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, definitely give a plug for the corporate giving garden model. Um, you know, as far as corporations, um, we, we are a great niche for uh, 
a volunteer experience for an organization. And I'm sure many of your organizations have been out here. In fact, you know, I'll never forget, it was Friday, March 13th of 2020. Um, we had saw probably every company cancel their shift for the next few weeks because we didn't know what was going on. And we totally understood because we wanted people to be safe. So we were kind of, you know, like, I don't want to say freaking out, but thinking, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to keep this place going? Because I think, as I mentioned earlier to you, that volunteers are truly essential with the work we do. But we kind of put an all call out and, you know, we saw individuals coming in. I think individuals wanting to see other people or make a difference. And we had to change our, our protocol with, because of course we wanted to be safe. So we had smaller number groups and we social distance within the volunteer center and, and used duct tape to show where people could stand and masks and temperature taking and all of that. But um, I encourage you when, and your, your corporate teams to come in and volunteer. I encourage you and your church groups, or I encourage you as an individual, or I encourage you with your book clubs or whatever networks you have to come in and sign up for a shift. We have volunteer shifts here and in Ottumwa. Here in Des Moines, we have them uh, a morning shift and an afternoon shift each day of the work week. We also have Wednesday evening shifts, and then we have one Saturday a month. And those shifts are um, about two and a half hours, two to two and a half hours. You will be trained when you get here. It's a fun environment, um, the music playing. I tell you, our groups are very productive and very competitive often. And um, at the end of the shift, we will tell you how many meals you've created or how many pounds you've transformed, um, how many you know pounds of potatoes you've looked at. Um, we try to make it fun, but also make it relative so folks understand really the impact they're making during their time here. So, you know, um, the corporate giving gardens, volunteering. We also have other volunteer activities. We are a, what we call a service enterprise organization. And that means we're certified or accredited through Volunteer Iowa with the, the fact that we try to have volunteers in every aspect of our work. Because if we can have them in every aspect of our work, that makes us as employees um, you know, putting the maximum output effort to that we can do. So we have folks doing um, data entry for us. You know, we have some folks coming every Friday to do mailings for us. We have people in the back pulling orders. We have, um, you know, people, volunteers learning how to drive the forklift. Um, uh, so again, volunteer, volunteering, there's like tons of opportunities. Uh, I also, another, another uh, way that corporations have really helped us are during our, you know, seasonal campaigns at the holiday time, we have a hunger free holidays campaign. Uh, in the summer, we have a campaign around childhood hunger. But one thing we saw a shift to with COVID is oftentimes people would do a food drive, you know, putting an all call out to their, you know, their networks on bringing food on this day and then they bring it to us. And we certainly still take those donations. But one thing that became, we had this in place before COVID, but it's really taken off is what we call virtual food drives. So we can work with your, you know, your internet platform or create a link where your team members, maybe your focus is childhood hunger. So, you know, we can set up a platform where your donations would go to our backpack sacks that we put in the in the children's backpack sack or backpack or school bags each week. So they have, um, you know, 13 items, shelf stable items that they can open on their own while their parents are maybe working that second job. Um, so this virtual food drive model has been very important. And sometimes teams are competitive within that, that realm too, because they want to you know, raise the most from their team. So there's different models we can work with there. Um, and then just, you know, really um, coming out and taking a tour. That's something, we've got some great meeting space here. We have a boardroom and we also have what we call a multi-purpose room, um, which could probably seat 40 to 50 people. We can configure it in different ways, but both rooms have full AV technology. You know, we've had 
companies come out and maybe they'll use one of the meeting spaces from you know nine to 11 for a team meeting. Then they'll bring in lunch and then they'll go back to the volunteer center for a shift kind of like team building camaraderie. Um, or, or we'll do that. We can do that at any kind of combination. Maybe you're here all day with meetings and then you volunteer in that Wednesday night shift. Or maybe you're here for a volunteer activity in the afternoon and then use our kitchen for, you know, beer and pizza afterwards or wine and cheese or whatever, whatever is kind of appeals to your group. But um, we're very open to, we love to have people come here. I'm happy to meet with someone anywhere at a coffee shop or at your office to tell about what we do. But when people come through the doors and especially see that distribution center and the magnitude of the, you know, the warehouse and what it all looks like, the, you know, the light bulbs really go off and eyes open wide. And that's why we love to have people come, come on site to, to see what really we're all about. So I'm sure I could talk about more, but again, um, we're just, we're really grateful for the, the corporate support we've received um, throughout this great community. And, and um, again, just love to have people come here or learn more about it. Thank you. A few more questions for you guys as great so far. Uh, Joelle, the next one is, what's one moment that stands out to you and you really realized you were making a difference? Hmm. It's kind of a tough one. First of all, Brigetta, I wanna say it is impressive. Like the food bank is impressive. So when we first started partnering with you guys, I had an opportunity to come out and do a tour and I didn't realize how big it was and, and just got a lot of education about how um, the food bank is really a warehouse and how it goes out to all of the food pantries across the state of Iowa. So yeah, I would encourage anyone listening in to take some time to go tour the facility. It really makes you understand what an impact um, it is and, and how large it is. So, okay. So that now that I babbled through that a little bit, I have some time to think about what, you know, I think, um, well, each week when we are donating produce to the giving garden, they weigh it and just to see those numbers come in every week. That makes a huge difference. Um, really, I think it's just the statistics that we see that make a huge difference. Um, I know that we're making a difference in the community to know that, you know, we packaged 14,000 meals and each one feeds six people. We donated, you know, 3,000 pounds of produce this year. And Brigetta knows this number, I can't remember, but like one pound of produce is the equivalent of, you know, 0.7 meals or something like that. I don't know that exact number, but, you know, we get those statistics and we share that with our employees to say, hey, this is what you're doing to make to make a difference. Um, so that's important. Also, one thing I really appreciate is um, the times that I have gone and dropped off the produce at the food bank. You guys have an amazing staff, Brigetta. They're also, they're always like very well, welcoming and, and thankful. They weigh it for me. Um, so I just know that they appreciate us bringing in that produce too. That's great to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Brigetta, can I ask the same question to you? What was the moment that stands out to you? Uh, you know, I don't know if there's one moment, some moments that really, you know, I love to make um, donor thank you calls or gratitude calls. And, you know, what I hear that the, it seems like the food bank donor is so humble. You know, I, the main messages I hear is that they just don't want to see people going hungry and really children going hungry. That's really, really where I hear a lot of comments and it's just, just very motivating and inspirational to me to hear that. Another piece that really resonates with folks um, who understand what we do and why they want to support us is the environmental sustainability piece. Um, food banking was uh, the basis for the, the creation of food banks um, are, is really twofold, but it really relates to food rescue and making sure food stays out of the landfill. And, um, you know, I'll try to say this quickly, but there's, a, there's this real person, his name was John Van Hengel. He was a retired CEO in Arizona who, after he retired, started working at what was then called a soup kitchen. We don't use that phrase anymore, but a meal site. And he saw coming every week was this woman with, you know, I've heard six children or eight children, but anyway, a large family, this woman with this large family. And he finally asked her one week, 
you know, what do you do on the nights you don't come here? And she shared that, oh, that's, you know, that's easy. I just go to the supermarket down the street. I look in their dumpster each night because every night there's, there's great produce and frozen meat in there and I take it home and make dinner. So, you know, for him, that was kind of an aha moment that every week he saw people in need, people going hungry, people who needed help, and then the food waste component. So that's how the first food bank was started down in Arizona, that is St. Mary's. And again, it's Phoenix or Scottsdale, I can never remember, but it's still there. And um, that's really, I think, an aha moment or, or a message that resonates with folks too. So, you know, not wanting people to go hungry, but also how can we better um, take, care, take care of our world and, and for the people in it. But one other, I guess, one other aha moment has, it came several times, but, um, we had several large mass mobile distributions during COVID, and I'm not sure if you saw that on the news. But the first time was here at our food bank location. We staged cars down at Grandview University, and then we had the cars coming through the food bank parking lot in lines of three. And um, I was helping put food in the, the vehicles that day, and I saw someone I used to work with. And she was, you know, you, again you never know she was just so happy that we were helping she wasn't embarrassed she was just so happy we were doing this her three kids were in the back seat and it was just a really I don't know a, an eye-opening moment for me knowing that we were doing that to help her and help others like her she later you know got she had lost her job her husband was a teacher she lost her job, but then she got another job and then she ended up helping at their church pantry. She has been in one of our newsletters. So again, it's that, that in between, you know, food insecurity can come and go. Um, one month you're okay, one month you aren't. But um, and some of the other distributions were, at, um, that was the only time we did it here. It, we realized we didn't have quite the best setup for it, but we were also at the state fairgrounds a couple of times. And if you've been down that grand, concourse, you know, that um, the lines were six um, vehicles wide. So, uh, and people were so appreciative and just so glad. And of course we couldn't have done any of that without the donations we received, the volunteers we had. Um, so I would say those moments stick out to me that again, really it could be any one of us and you just don't know when it might happen. It could be any one of your friends or family. And um, I'm, I'm glad that people look for help and, and feel okay asking for help. Thank you both. Those are wonderful stories and insights. I love that. Joelle, the next question is for you. What advice would you give to someone that's interested in starting a corporate garden? Okay. Um, like I said, certainly call me if you are interested, but advice, first of all, um, reach out to your employees make sure that they're interested in volunteering in it because the last thing you want to do is um, till up the soil and then not have enough people to work in it every year. But um, if it's anything like the experience that I had here, I think you will get that type of buy-in. Um, so that would be the first step. Um, second, I also had, I also had um, members from the food bank and food and United Way come out and talk to our employees during our initial kickoff meeting and talk about in food insecurity. So educate your employees on why we're doing this. It's not just not just to grow some vegetables, but what we're doing and the impact that we're making in the community. So I think um, that really helped too for them to hear um, the food bank talk about food insecurity and, and, and everything. So that was a great thing that we did. Um, challenges every year is you know what to grow and, and how to keep the rabbits out of the garden so we have a great facilities department that has helped us with that um, I did find our, our biggest crop that we have are our tomatoes it keeps our volunteers active it gives them lots of things to do and Brigetta we were told this year that we didn't need tomatoes they don't want our tomatoes so. oh dear oh I'm sorry 
<laughs> I know, so, yeah. Um, so I do have to say, I'm no longer leading the garden. I turned it over to a coworker last year. So I ran into him. He actually called me yesterday and he's like, Hey, I need to talk to you about something. And then a little bit later, I ran into him in the hallway and he goes, and he told me about, it. he goes, we got to figure it out though. So I think they're just going to do some different crops this year and, and try something different so we can make it work. So again, it's, it's not so much just growing vegetables and donating it. It's wanting to know from the food bank, you know, what do you need? So we, we can certainly adapt to that. Um, so that, that's a challenge, making sure that we can grow the right produce that the, the food bank wants. Thank you, Joelle. Forget I have one more question for you and then I have one more to round us out for both of you. Um, could you expand a little bit? I know you talked about it a little bit, but could you expand on how the Food Bank of Iowa addresses food insecurity with regards to public policy? Yes, well, and I just pulled up, I heard that might be a question. I'm probably not the best versed in this area, but at Feeding America helps us a lot with that. And we routinely get um, information from the Feeding America governor, I'm looking here, government relations and public policy team. They tell us how we can plug in with our legislators and the messages that they um, advocate us, you know, um, going to our legislators about. Um, Michelle Book, our, our CEO and president, is very connected. And um, she routinely, like she, you know, she routinely meets with, I would say, legislators, you know, bipartisan from, from all areas. Um, she's, you know, with the governor's been in here. Um, we, we try to tell our messaging and share how it will help in their communities, but also to our food banks there, in addition to our food banks in Iowa, there is a Iowa food bank association, which our food banks all are a member of. That's where a lot of the advocacy and public policy, um, as an overarching, um, organization, um, takes place. So, um, we're just, you know, trying to, you know, and also to Michelle goes on what she calls a listening tour each year. So she is getting ready to go again. She will visit every county, every one of our 55 counties, and we'll reach out and happy to meet with any um, public officials in those areas as well to talk about our needs. Um, so it's just, it's more education. It's more just, again, letting people know what's going on, what the needs are. Uh, we work closely with the USDA program too. So I don't know if that answers that question. That does, thank you. And I have one more question for both of you. We've kind of touched on this, but I figure we can round it out with this still, but what actionable steps, big big or small things, do you think people can take to address food insecurity? Either, you know, we've talked about organizations a lot, but even just generally in their lives. You go um, first, Joel, because I'll probably okay. just talk way too long. <laughs> Actionable steps. So, so really, personally, one of the organizations I made a donation to during COVID was the food bank. Um, I think just having that relationship and that tie with them. Um, I'm on their email list. I got an email and they talked about the need, especially during COVID. So my husband and I talked about it. I'm like, yes, let's make a donation. So I know money is always needed. Um, Brigetta had talked about like the food drives and the virtual food drives. So that was, that was some, that's something that our organization has also done in the past that is pretty easy. Organize a food drive, organize a virtual food drive um, with your department, with your, with your organization. Um, that's a pretty actionable step that you can take. Um, look into the Salvation Army breakfast casseroles and what you need to do. Um, to, to, they give you the recipe, they give you the pans. You just need to distribute the pans and then turn the cast, collect the casseroles and turn them back into Salvation Army. So that's a really easy one. So I think there's a lot you can do out there. Um, United Way has volunteer opportunities listed on their website all the time. I'm sure Food Bank is, is one, of those, one of those organizations that's listed out there. Mm -hmm. Should I go next? Yes, go ahead, oh. Bargana. Sorry, I was trying to get to the unmute button. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's okay. Well, again, I think we, we've kind of talked high level and Joel, you know, kind of simply said it too, you know, volunteer, virtual food drives, um, real food drives, um, 
donations again for um, the per there's a lot of formula behind it, but um, we buy we buy items by the truckload. So um, you know, ten dollars can feed a family for a week through us, and um, you know, just again with the purchasing power we have and the donations we receive. So consider that, and but really, it's just spread awareness, spread, you know, the education pieces. And I wish I had more time to talk to, because, you know, we talk about food insecurity and I know you gave that definition and it's really access to, to food so you, you can live a, 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 a productive life and give back to your community. But we talk about, you know, beyond access to food, it's access to healthy and nutritious food. And uh, we're trying to do a better job of that. We have a grant through the Partnership for Healthy America where we're introducing a nutrition ranking system to the food we're bringing in. Um, again, the produce that the corporate giving gardens are, are sharing with us. Um, and, and the tomatoes, I, I, you know, I love tomatoes, but you know, we do emphasize <laughs> a lot of the produce that comes through, especially if we get it in bulk quantity are more of that hardier, you know, like, you know, apples, potatoes, carrots, right. onions, those types of things. But but we still, you know, even if we'll we'll try to get the, those more more perishable items to a pantry quickly, because mm -hmm. that's really where the 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 person in need goes to. So, yeah, volunteer. You know, tell tell about our work. Encourage people to come in for a tour. Encourage them to come in to volunteer. Um, really, those are all ways that. Um, we, you, you and your, your corporations can get involved with us. And, and I know Joelle mentioned too, like with the corporate giving gardens, I know Emily Shear probably she was maybe one person who did come out and talk to your teams, but I'm happy too. we, you know, but although we'd love to have you come here, I will do a virtual presentation like this with a quarterly team meeting or happy to come out to your location and give that hunger miss presentation. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, utilize us as a resource for education and, and sharing that ways that people can get involved and help. All right. Thank you. That's all the questions we had. And we're just about at time. I just want to thank you both again for participating and offering yourselves and your knowledge uh, down the road. Also, uh, Sydney, I'll turn it back over to you if you have anything to round it out. I'll echo what you said, Marina. Thank you, both Joelle and Brigetta. I thought that information was incredible. A lot of information, so super valuable. Um, we can send out contact information to the group if anybody has follow-up questions or wants to get involved, happy to do that. So thank you to the fellows that arranged this and put it all together. Thanks for your great questions, great answers, and um, we're about at time. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.